Hello. Uh, this video lecture, I'll be talking about the criminal justice system uh, and mass incarceration and what's known as the new Jim Crow. Uh, it'll be the second in a, a series of three lectures about how social inequality is reproduced through institutions. So I'm going to pull up the PowerPoint and get right into it. So uh, in the previous lecture, we talked about how inequalities are reproduced through the educational system, uh, through schooling. Uh, and we um, are looking at the film called um, uh, about being, you know, crim the criminalization of black girls in schools, uh, the push out. And so this lecture kind of complements and feeds off of what we talked about in the last one, um, where we talked about the school to prison pipeline and, and those sorts of factors. So here we take the analysis towards looking specifically at the criminal justice system. And so we'll be looking at uh, this term that's often called mass incarceration, uh, which describes the dramatic increase in the prison population in the United States in the last 40 or 50 years. And um, how mass incarceration is connected with the so-called war on drugs and the way that the war on drugs has been fought in the United States. Um, that'll take us to uh, the main text that I'll be talking about here, which is a book called The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. And uh, we'll be thinking about the political origins of mass incarceration and the war on drugs in the period, you know, roughly between the late 1960s through the 1990s. So this is a, a, an analysis that's offered up uh, by Alexander in The New Jim Crow and uh, by a, a number of other authors. Um, it's also an analysis that's put forward in the documentary film called 13th, uh, which I recommend. Um, so we'll be basically looking at those uh, texts and uh, talking about the how this trend towards mass incarceration and the war on drugs was the product of a particular political historical moment. So first, some statistics um, to give us a sense of the scope of the problem when we talk about mass incarceration in the United States. Uh, as we see on the graph on the right, the United States uh, incarcerates a higher percentage of our population than any other country around the world. Um, and it's really not even close. Um, the United States far and away uh, incarcerates, as it says here, um, 670 people per 100,000 of the population. So a much greater percentage than um, other comparable countries. Uh, in terms of like who um, is incarcerated and who is more likely to be incarcerated, um, when we kind of look at this from an intersectional approach in terms of class, race, and, and, and gender, um, we look, at, we see that uh, among uh, men, it's one in nine men are likely to be in, imprisoned uh, at some point in their lives. Um, we're talking about people born in 2001 who would be, you know, in their early 20s today. Uh, whereas uh, with women, it's uh, one in 56. But when we break this down in terms of race, um, we see very dramatic differences. So one in 17 white men are likely to be incarcerated at some point, imprisoned at some point. Um, but one in three black men who were born in 2001 are likely to be imprisoned and one in six Latino men. Likewise, when we look at women, uh, one out of 111 white women 
will be imprisoned in their lifetime, but uh, one in 18 black women and one in 45 Latino women. Um, we'll be talking about how this uh, trend towards mass incarceration is connected with the war on drugs. Um, if you look at this graph on the, on the right, you'll notice uh, a dramatic change that happened in the size of the prison population um, around the 1970s and 1980s, especially, um, as we've kind of emphasized in, I think, virtually every uh, one of these video lectures, the 1970s and 1980s is a real turning point, a, a pivotal moment in the kinds of trends towards increasing inequality that we that we see. And so when you look at the size of the state and federal prison population uh, in the United States between like 1925 uh, all the way up until the early 1970s, it pretty much held constant um, with just a slight increase. Um, but still, you know, as late as 1974, it's still around 200,000 people. Um, and then the prison population really takes off, as we see in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, the late 70s, 80s, and 90s. And uh, it's at this point that we get to, you know, from somewhere around 300,000 to, you know, around 2 million. Uh, so we see like a kind of an exponential increase uh, in the size of the prison population. And, and the most significant factor for this uh, upsurge in incarceration has been the war on drugs. And specifically the way that the war on drugs has been uh, selectively fought. When the Reagan administration declared its war on drugs in 1982 and, and sort of escalated things, um, Rates of drug use were actually on the uh, on the decline. Uh, the 1970s had been an especially high time, uh, pun intended, for um, drug use. Um, but uh, by the 80s, things were starting to sort of taper off, uh, um, just within larger cultural trends. So this is important to note because it's like the 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 war on drugs was not like a respond toward a response towards increasing drug use. Um, it in fact had, as we will see, you know, a more kind of political motivations. Um, it was not simply, you know, we have to do this because so many people are using drugs. Uh, it in, in fact, drug use was actually beginning to decline. And um, again, it, it's also in terms of what part of the population it is has been fought, the war on drugs has been fought against, has also been politically selective. So as it says here, people sell and use illegal drugs at roughly the same rates across racial groups, but black men are 20 to 50 times more likely to be incarcerated on drug charges. Uh, and so, again, this, this tells us about, you know, th this begins to give us a clue as to the way that the war on drugs has been fought and, you know, what communities, what neighborhoods, you know, uh, who has been, who has found themselves in the crosshairs of the, of the drug war. The number of African Americans under correctional control, that is to say, in prison or jail, uh, on probation or parole is now greater than the number of slaves in the year 1850. So when we look at, um, in the last lecture, we kind of emphasized the way in which budget priorities have um, shifted more and more towards incarceration and uh, away from education. And as this graph shows, um, it's in fact much more expensive to incarcerate someone than to educate them. This graph shows kind of state by state um, how much is spended, uh, expended um, on prisons per inmate uh, 
versus how much is uh, expended on education per student. And as we see in every case, uh, it's much, much greater. Um, it's much, you know, when you're talking about states like New York and California, you know, we're talking about like 50 to $60,000 a year to incarcerate someone versus, you know, 10 to $15,000 a year um, to educate them. Uh, similarly, you know, this basically breaks this down in terms of the discrepancies uh, from state to state. And so, you know, uh, it's not surprising that this, the states like California and New York, you know, the more expensive states are the ones where um, the average cost per inmate uh, is much greater. So basically in this graph, like the, the darker, the, the green uh, in the graph, the more expensive it is to incarcerate somebody. So this is, again, a, um, really been a, a kind of a political decision in terms of uh, budget priorities. And, you know, whereas um, the rate of constructing new schools and colleges and universities ha has really slowed, the uh, construction of, of prisons um, has been much greater. Um, especially in states like California. Um, along with this is, is also the rise of uh, so-called private prisons, um, which are still like a kind of a, a, a small part of the overall carceral state, but one that is indeed growing um, in part because of the burden of spending uh, in the public sector. So this resulting burden on the public specter, uh, sector led to the emergence, the modern emergence of for-profit prisons in many states uh, and in the federal system. And uh, it, the map on the right, you know, sort of gives you a, a map as to where these are. You see that a lot of them are, you know, concentrated in the South and, um, and in Texas. Of the 1.2 million people in federal and state prisons, about 8% or you know, roughly 100,000 people were in private prisons as of year end 2020. A total of 26 states and the federal government use private corporations like the GEO Group, Core Civic, LaSalle Corrections, and Management and Training Corporation to run some of their corrections facilities. And since 2000, the number of people housed in these prison, private prisons has increased by about 14%. Um, this is obviously uh, a troubling trend, um, even if these private prisons are still, you know, a, a small part of the overall car carceral state. When you're talking about private prisons, of course, you're you know you're talking about people now you know, corporations that have a vested interest in, you know, in their, their profits depend upon people being locked up. Um, and so as we see with so many other industries and, and businesses, once, you know, corporations um, have, you know, a, a, a profitable interest in something happening, they go to all kinds of political measures and, and lobbying and, you know, all kinds of ways to make sure that, you know, that their uh, facilities are, uh, you know, are, are being used and, and making a profit for them. Uh, and in this case, um, the, the, the basis of their profit is, is incarceration. So this is something that should really, and, and does give a lot of people cause for concern. The book that, we'll be talking about really made a splash in the last, um, I guess, 10 years, maybe since it's been written um, called the new Jim Crow uh, written by a legal scholar by the name of Michelle Alexander, uh, who's pictured here alongside her book. And what Alexander argues is that mass incarceration is a system of racialized social control, which replaced 
uh, the old system of Jim Crow, the old system of uh, segregation um, that was explicitly uh, racist, um, and that old system of Jim Crow that was basically in place from the end of slavery in you know 1865 through uh, the 1960s and was you know the old Jim Crow as we've talked about in a couple of lectures was basically dismantled by the civil rights movement uh, and by organized protest and civil disobedience uh, particularly in the south um Al uh, Michelle Alexander basically argues that this this system of mass incarceration is kind of the system of social control, of racialized social control that followed in the wake of, in the aftermath of the dismantling of the old Jim Crow. And she says that the chief method for conducting mass incarceration has been the war on drugs, uh, which was initially declared by the Nixon administration in 1969 but was put into practice and escalated by the Reagan administration in 1982. So Richard Nixon starts talking about a war on drugs in uh, the late 1960s, but it's really during the Reagan years that the money and the equipment and the surveillance technologies and the, um, the rollback of, of legal protections um, all of these aspects of mass incarceration really get uh, implemented and institutionalized by the Reagan administration in the 1980s. The criminal justice system uh, does not exercise direct discrimination in the post-civil rights era. This is what Alexander argues. But nevertheless, the drug war is organized to control and disempower Black people, particularly, especially Black men. So she's saying, like, you know, unlike the old Jim Crow, which was explicitly racist and said, you know, in, encoded into laws, you know, which public facilities Black people could use versus which ones white people could use. Um, the new Jim Crow is not explicitly racist in this kind of way, uh, but nevertheless, the outcomes, the, uh, you know, the results of this drug war, this war on drugs has been to systematically disempower black communities. And she says that furthermore, that the colorblindness of the legal system provides an ideological rationalization for denying the racist nature of mass incarceration. So the fact that it's not explicitly racist, it's not directly racist, provides you know, a way of basically rationalizing the war on drugs um, and this system of mass incarceration. But when we look at the results, um, as we did a couple of slides ago, um, the, the outcomes are, uh, are very clear. Um, just a quick sort of um, history lesson on the old Jim Crow, the Jim Crow South, as I said, was was really institutionalized uh, in the years after the Civil War with the end of slavery. And so with the end of slavery, Black people enjoyed what W.E.B. Du Bois called a brief moment in the sun during Reconstruction. Black people had voting rights, built schools and hoped for land redistribution uh, program that was briefly implemented um, that came to be known as like the 40 acres and a mule, uh, you know, sort of ideal that um, was briefly implemented with the end of the Civil War, but then systematically uh, abandoned. So um, this is why Du Bois calls this, though, like a, a brief moment in the sun is because there's this moment after the Civil War where there is a, a sense of possibility and opportunity and that the United States can kind of like become a new, a different kind of country and that there can be, you know, greater equality and that, you know, that it can, the United States can kind of like live up to uh, live up to its ideals. Um, this, you know, kind of brief moment in the sun happens in the late 1860s um, and then is kind of systematically rolled back. 
uh, as Du Bois described in his book uh, called Black Reconstruction. Uh, the white Southern elite fought to halt and repeal these changes, uh, and they eventually succeeded in instituting a new system of segregation that disenfranchised blacks and kept them separated from poor whites. So this would be the Jim Crow system of uh, segregation that became institutionalized uh, in the starting in the you know late 1860s and into the 1870s, and then certainly by you know the beginning of the 20th century, there's this system is is basically been already put into place, and Jim Crow remained in place until the Civil Rights Movement pushed the federal government to pass legislation that effectively abolished it. Um, we looked at some of those. Uh, struggles in the last lecture when we looked at um, struggles to desegregate schools um, from the Brown versus Board of Education uh, Supreme Court case through, you know, the, the various social movements and organized struggles that were um, meant to kind of break the back of Jim Crow and eventually uh, succeeded, um, but not after you know, a, a tremendous amount of, of time and, and sacrifice. So in her book, uh, in the new Jim Crow, uh, Michelle Alexander is talking about how um, institutional racism occurs at every phase of mass incarceration from policing to the courts to life after prison. The war on drugs has given the police extraordinary discretion in stopping and searching anyone they believe to be suspicious. The federal government has also offered substantial financial incentives to police departments for making mass arrests in the war on drugs. Black men are stopped and searched at highly disproportionate rates but these policing practices have withstood legal challenges unless deliberate racial discrimination can be proven. The threat of harsh sentences for drug offenses has led most defendants to accept a plea bargain without ever going to jail, uh, without ever going to trial. So these are these sort of key points that uh, Alexander makes in her book. Um, it talks about how, the again, the war on drugs has been selectively fought in terms of what which communities have been targeted, um, what uh, sorts of people are more likely to be stopped and searched, um, and also the way in which, like, these uh, practices, although they are highly discriminatory, They've still been um, upheld in the courts because uh, there's no, you know, explicit kind of racial discrimination that's encoded into the law in the way that was true of the old Jim Crow. So again, this is a system of uh, racialized social control, as Michelle Alexander. Uh, calls it, um, but one that is um, able to continue to function in a post-civil rights era because it's not explicitly racist in the ways that um, were true previously. And so Alexander, you know, here is in, in the, um, the slide on the right is talking about the way that things have, you know, changed now with, you know, the legalization of marijuana being so um, prevalent in in many states, um, obviously not nationwide, but in many states like, you know, California. Uh, she says, here are white men poised to run big marijuana businesses, dreaming of cashing in a big, big money, big businesses selling weed. After 40 years of impoverished black kids getting prison time for selling weed and their families and futures destroyed. Now white men are planning to get rich 
doing precisely the same thing. So, you know, this is um, Alexander sort of commenting on the, the sort of the hypocrisy and again, the, the selective way in which this uh, war on drugs was, was fought and still has these ramifications, not only for the people behind bars, but for their families and their communities. So the, the new Jim Crow describes the various stages of mass incarceration and how they work against people of color, despite being formally colorblind. The war on drugs gave police the power to proactively stop and search anyone under any pretext. Although these practices violate the Fourth Amendment protections against unreasonable search and seizure, they are routinely upheld in court if the police can attain even the flimsiest form of consent. So this is part of how um, the new Jim Crow has also been a kind of a, a rollback of people's protection under the law, um, the Fourth Amendment saying, you know, that we have a, a right to, um, you know, to not be stopped and seized. And yet, you know, in places like New York, you know, they had a whole sort of policing policy known as stop and frisk um, that, uh, you know, was was implemented for, for many years and was sort of part and parcel of this larger uh, system of mass incarceration and the war on drugs. The federal government has also encouraged local police departments to prioritize the drug war by rewarding them with cash grants and military hardware. According to Alexander, it is doubtful that the drug war would have been launched with such intensity on the ground, but for the bribes offered for law enforcement's cooperation. So this is this kind of thing like we see in the picture on the right, the, the basically like the, the militarization of the police. Um, and the way in which like, you know, a lot of like military kind of hardware and uh, equipment and surveillance technology and weaponry has all kind of, you know, filtered down from the military down to the local police departments so that they, you know, as shown in this picture effectively, you know, look like they're carrying out you know, like a military operation in like Afghanistan or Iraq or, you know, somewhere like that. Uh, but in fact, this is, you know, probably happening in a in a city or suburb, you know, somewhere in the United States. So the sort of militarization of the police has been actively rewarded and facilitated by the federal government. Mm -hmm. Police um, have primarily focused on inner city ghettos in fighting the war on drugs, despite the fact that whites and blacks use drugs and sell drugs at similar rates. The predictable result has been that people of color comprise a higher uh, disproportionate, a uh, highly disproportionate number of arrests for drug offenses. Uh, three quarters of those in prison for drugs have been black or Latino. Systemic yet formally colorblind discrimination continues in the sentencing phase. One crucial feature of the war on drugs has been mandatory minimum sentencing that is much more stringent for crack than cocaine. Whereas mandatory minimum sentences of five years are imposed for anyone caught with 500 grams of powder cocaine the same sentence has been applied to those with only five grams of crack. The vast majority of people arrested for crack are, are black, while co co cocaine offenders are predominantly white. So here again, we see you know, that even though the system is formally colorblind, in reality, there's like two justice systems that are at work, both when it comes to policing and when it comes to sentencing. So in terms of policing, you know, it probably doesn't sur surprise anybody who lives in America 
to know that police are much like more likely to uh, stop and arrest people in uh, black and brown communities, uh, particularly urban communities in the United States. Um, and uh, similarly, when it comes to the sentencing uh, phase of things, people have called this a form of like apartheid sentencing um, that again, where the, the racism isn't written into the laws, but there is like this effective, uh, you know, difference in outcomes. And so in the 1980s, it was basically institutionalized this difference between powder cocaine and crack cocaine in terms of sentencing and what are known as mandatory minimums, meaning like if you get caught with a certain amount of this drug, you know, you're going away for a certain amount of time, no matter what the circumstances are or the judge's discretion or anything like that. It's like you get caught with five grams of crack, you're going away, you're, you're, you're going to be behind bars for a certain number of years. And so there's a real sort of hypocrisy and double standard um, because Again, it, it, I'm sure it surprises no one who lives um, in the United States that there is this difference between who's more likely to be busted for crack versus who's more likely to be busted for having powder cocaine. Um, so Alexander talks about this, um, the, this effects of mass incarceration, and she says it doesn't just stop um, in terms of like who's being imprisoned and for how long. She says that this system of mass incarceration continues to infect, continues to affect people's lives, you know, long after, you know, they've supposedly done their time, uh, they've paid their debt to society. And yet, once people have been, you know, convicted and incarcerated, the kind of stigma uh, continues to hang over them, even when they're, you know, uh, free and, and being, you know, trying to reintegrate into society. So Alexander argues that the effects of mass incarceration continue to be fe uh, felt by ex-convicts after they are released from prison or jail. And she compares the discrimination encountered by former criminals with the denial of rights to Southern Blacks under segregation. She describes the difficulties that people face in getting a job and finding a place to live after they are released. Um, she also describes how convicted felons also lose their right to vote and serve on juries, which she compares to the denial of citizenship rights under Jim Crow. So again, in certain kinds of circumstances, um, you know, people are being uh, stripped of their uh, rights, you know, particularly like voting rights um, and uh, their, you know, uh, other kind of citizenship rights, like serving on juries in a way that was exactly the same as it was under the old Jim Crow South. This map of the states across, you know, uh, 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 on the right side here is kind of showing you like the different state policies as far as, you know, people um, who have served time or been convicted, like whether or not they can vote or what the conditions are for their voting. Um, and the ones, the states that are, you know, in the red and, and orange and yellow are the ones that, you know, are the, the more like conservative in terms of like, if you are an ex-con, um, you have that much harder uh, time being able to get your voting rights back or you don't, you don't vote at all. You just don't get to vote at all. And so again, this is this is like a this was a systematic thing that also happened under the old Jim Crow. Um, the old Jim Crow was much more explicitly racist about it, um, but the effect here is uh, largely the same in terms of the outcome. So um, also, you know, when it comes to life after prison, she's saying that 
mass incarceration does not end when people are released from prison. Uh, Alexander defines mass incarceration in a way that also includes the larger web of laws, rules, policies, and customs that control those labeled criminals both in and out of prison. The kind of like the stigma that follows people, you know, after they've paid their debt to society. And so while there are over 2 million people behind bars, there are approximately 5 million more on probation or parole or, you know, in some way, they're in the system. Um, they're in the, they're subject to this uh, criminal justice system, to this carceral system. And in total, one in every 31 adults, one out of every 31 adults is caught in this system of mass incarceration in some way or another. So again, it's something that, you know, uh, really has an expansive effect on many institutions throughout society. Alexander's analysis of life after prison extends her argument by comparing mass incarceration with Jim Crow. She demonstrates how legal forms of discrimination and exclusion continue to afflict ex-convicts long after they have paid their debt to society. And so while Alexander's main argument concerns imprisonment, she deepens the analysis by discussing how the stigma of incarceration impedes the ability to get work, to find housing, uh, and to integrate into mainstream society. Um, so basically how, uh, you know, why it is that, you know, people have such a hard time sort of reintegrating into society because they continue to encounter these obstacles with uh, finding work and getting housing and, and broadly sort of reintegrating into society. The similarities with Jim Crow persist outside of prison as Alexander explains. A, she, she says a criminal record today authorizes precisely the forms of discrimination we supposedly left behind. Discrimination in employment, housing, education, public benefits, and jury service. So all of those are, it's still legal to basically discriminate against people if they've, you know, done time, uh, you know, if they've been, if they've got a criminal record, these forms of discrimination, you know, continue to be routinely practiced, um, you know, when it comes to people applying for a job or people applying for public housing or, you know, people trying to get a, a loan to go to school and stuff like that. Um, beyond these formal mechanisms of discrimination and inclusion, exclusion, there is the general stigma and loss of respect within one's community. And she says, in sum, today, a criminal freed from prison has scarcely more rights and arguably less respect than a freed slave or a black person living free in Mississippi at the height of Jim Crow. That's an especially strong statement there at the end where she makes explicit how she sees the connection between the old Jim Crow and the new Jim Crow. You know, how this criminal justice system um, and the system of mass incarceration produces the same kinds of outcomes, even without being explicitly racist and discriminatory um, in its uh, institutional framework, it still has these discriminatory and racist outcomes that result from it. Um, so Alexander, you know, to, to kind of go a little bit deeper here into say the issue of housing and homelessness, um, Alexander describes the various ways that people are discriminated against and excluded from mainstream society after they get out of prison. For more than 650, 50,000 people released from prison each year, finding a place to live is the most immediate concern and often the most difficult 
One study revealed that a quarter of the residents in homeless shelters had been incarcerated within the last year. At the behest of President Clinton uh, in the 1990s, the Housing and Urban Development uh, Department, HUD, de uh, adopted a one strike and you're out policy that automatically excluded drug offenders from el eligibility for public housing. So this is something to, I think, keep in mind when we, you know, think about homelessness, you know, like here in the Bay Area um, and, you know, homelessness uh, across the country is to think about this connection with uh, the, you know, criminal justice system and the way that policies like, you know, one strike and you're out have made it more difficult for people to get back on their feet when they are released from prison. And that, of course, you know, is going to make it much more likely that a person is going to end up back in prison um, if people are not able to find housing or find a job. You know, it's going to make it that much more difficult for them to be able to kind of reintegrate into society. Uh, this is Alexander's uh, point about all of this. And so we see the um, statistics here about the, the formerly incarcerated people having very high rates of homelessness and that this is especially prevalent among women and people of color. So this is a statistic that's giving you, um, you know, showing you like that formerly incarcerated people are like 10 times more likely than the general public uh, to be, uh, to have been homeless. Um, when it comes to work and employment, um, again, another major difficulty for finding, uh, for, for newly released offenders is finding work. The reluctance to hire people with criminal records is greatest in, in retail and the service sector where most of the new jobs are now created. Uh, Alexander cites numerous examples of job advertisements which explicitly state that people with criminal histories will not be considered. And she therefore concludes millions find themselves locked out of the legal economy and no one with a record has a more difficult time getting hired than black men. So again, we see here the uh, uh, in the graph here on the right side, um, the disproportionately higher rates of unemployment for far formerly incarcerated peoples. And so we see that actually among formerly incarcerated peoples, it's black women who have the highest rates of unemployment. Um, as high as 44%, um, where, and uh, for Black men, uh, around 35%. So again, there's a um, racial inequality when just when it comes to the disproportionate impact on people's ability to get a job when they get out of prison. It's mo more, it's like easier for white people who have been incarcerated to get a job when they get out of prison than it is for black people to get a job when uh, they've been formerly incarcerated. Um, when it comes to uh, welfare, poverty, and, and the family, uh, Alexander also says that the obstacles faced by people getting out of prison do not end with just housing and employment. Alexander describes how former offenders are burdened with sizable debts to probation departments, courts, and child, uh, child support enforcement offices. Um, the welfare reform legislation that was signed by Bill Clinton in 1996 also made people with drug-related felony convictions ineligible for public assistance. And the vast majority of states deny people the right to vote when they're on parole. And some continue to deny voting rights for years after that, uh, as we saw in the, in the previous slide. So 
again, this has, this continues to have impacts on people and on their families um, long after they have paid their debt to society and done their time. Um, Alexander is by no means the only scholar to have talked about these uh, systematic inequalities in the criminal justice system. Um, there is, in fact, a, a pretty solid um, you know, field of, of literature about this. Um, so among other legal scholars, remember Michelle Alexander is a, is a, is a legal scholar, somebody who, who works in the, in the legal system. Uh, but uh, among other legal scholars, Michael Tonry, uh, his book is shown here in the, in the right. Michael Tonry has undertaken the most comprehensive studies of mass incarceration in relation to racism. Since the 1990s, his work has examined the connections between race, crime, and punishment. Uh, also, Mark Maurer of the Sentencing Project has conducted groundbreaking investigations into the links between race, class, and the criminal justice system. A lot of the graphs and statistics I used earlier in the lecture um, come from the Sentencing Project. The subfield of, of criminal cr uh, critical criminology, say that five times fast, <laughs> critical criminology, uh, the study of crime from the perspective of Marxism and conf conflict theories of society has also produced important studies of mass incarceration. Uh, the criminologist Todd R. Clear examined how the growth of America's penal population has adverse effects on inner city neighborhoods, uh, how mass incarceration actually worsens the social problems it claims to solve. So all of these um, scholars have, from one angle or another, you know, from a legal standpoint, from a standpoint of criminology, have been able to show, you know, from one angle or another, uh, the sort of, you know, race bias, the racial bias that is kind of encoded into this um, mass incarceration system and the way in which like that that system continues to impact families and communities uh, you know long um, beyond just the people who are actually incarcerated. So mass incarceration um, and the prison prison industrial complex. Um, within sociology, a guy by the name of Loequa Quant who teaches up at uh, Berkeley, explored the economic basis of prisons. Uh, Neoliberal capitalism creates, in his words, a surplus population of poor youth, and mass incarceration is a booming industry that absorbs and controls them. So basically, Quant's argument is that, you know, in a sort of post-industrial or neoliberal capitalist society, there just isn't a lot of use for the labor of young people in inner city neighborhoods in the way that there might have been in previous generations when there was more industrial and manufacturing kinds of employment. And so there's this sort of like surplus youth, this, you know, this um, population of people who from the standpoint of capital, you know, don't really have like, you know, much or any economic value and so mass incarceration has come about as a system, uh, according to Waquant, uh, as, a, as an industry that, that absorbs and, and controls this surplus population that, you know, otherwise might be considered um, kind of dangerous from the standpoint of, of capital and its social order. The radical scholar Angela Davis um, has also investigated what she calls the prison industrial complex uh, in this book uh, called Our Prisons Obsolete um, and in her uh, larger work as a, as a prison abolitionist. The term the prison industrial complex originally comes from the social historian Mike Davis uh, who invented the term in 1995 as he condemned the overlapping economic and political interests behind California's booming penal system. So Mike Davis was especially um, a great historian of, of 
the state of California um, and the city of Los Angeles in particular. And so he was able to show, you know, in the 80s and 90s to kind of expose how California was at the, the you know, at the lead, you know, taking a, a leading role across the country um, in this system of mass incarceration. So in terms of like how, what we want to do in the next, you know, few slides, um, these last few slides in the, in the lecture is to look at how this system historically, how this came about. Um, I really recommend the, the documentary called 13th um, that I think is still on, on Netflix um, or was for, you know, for quite some time, it was done maybe seven or eight years ago. Um, and uh, the, the documentary does a good job of, of giving you a kind of a historical perspective on how this system of mass incarceration came about and, and how it's kind of continuous with other systems of racialized social control that came before it. Um, as uh, that documentary shows, and, and also, you know, Michelle Alexander talks about this history in her book on the new Jim Crow, the, the birth of the, the war on drugs, at least as a, as a rhetoric, as, a, as something that was, you know, being talked about, was in the, in the Nixon administration. So be, beginning with the Nixon administration, which, you know, went from 1969 until Nixon uh, resigned in scandal in 1974, the Republican Party had built an electoral coalition, uh, uh, electoral coalition that depended on the support of working class whites, especially in the South. Republicans built this coalition by appealing to cultural conservatism in a backlash against the social changes of the 1960s. While it was no longer possible to directly invoke race in the post-civil rights era, Republicans tapped into the racial hostility and fear through the seemingly colorblind rhetoric of crime, drugs, welfare, and states' rights. This would become this would come to be known as like the Southern strategy in the Republican Party. Um, how in the 1960s and early 1970s, there were a lot of people who, uh, especially in the South, who were put off, uh, you know, who were scared uh, and angry about the ways that the country was changing, um, specifically about the victories of the civil rights movement and the breakdown of the old system of Jim Crow. And so Nixon and the Republican Party, you know, made a concerted effort to appeal to these um, white conservatives that were throughout the country, but especially concentrated in the South. And they couldn't do this by in the ways that like maybe previous generations had done where they explicitly, you know, talked about race and, and were explicitly racist. But instead, they used these kind of like coded dog whistle kinds of terms, uh, talking about crime, talking about welfare, talking about drugs that conjured up a certain image um, that was associated with Black people, but without explicitly saying so. And so they were able to, the Republican Party was able to, um, you know, to, to take national power uh, in part through this strategy, in large part through this strategy. Um, you have to remember that like for, you know, um, for centuries, for you know, at least for the, the the decades before, for years and years and years before, white Southerners almost always voted Democrat. Uh, they voted for the Democratic Party because you know the Republicans were the party of Lincoln, and they were the party that they, they they did not like the Republicans. Uh, white Southerners did not, and. Um, Nixon's strategy was kind of to win them over in this uh, time period 
in the late 60s and early 70s when people were really threatened by what the civil rights movement had been able to accomplish. And so they're able to win them over with these kind of racially coded appeals to crime and drugs and gangs and, you know, these things that were kind of racist without being explicitly so. So these movements in the 1960s and 1970s had seen, you know, a kind of growing militancy and there was um, these movements for racial and gender equality movements against the Vietnam War, uh, the, you know, the peace movement, movements for sexual liberation, uh, you know, the counterculture, the hippie subculture, you know, all of these were things that really, you know, from one direction or another were, were very challenging to the established order and were threatening uh, to, you know, millions of people um, who considered themselves more like cultural conservatives. Uh, at the same time, there were also numerous urban rebellions that had been triggered by police violence between 1964 and 1972. And so campaigning against these social movements and this upsurge of popular rebellion, Nixon and the Republicans used crime and drugs as code words or as political dog whistles. You know, a dog whistle in, in the sense that, like, you know, it, it kind of operates under, you know, under the frequency, under the radar. And so supporters, you know, know what you're talking about. Um, but, you know, it, you have plausible deniability in terms of like it's not explicitly racist. So groups like, you know, the Black Panther Party is, which is, you know, shown here, were a real threat um, to these interests um, and Richard Nixon and the Republicans were able to kind of win over the people who were, you know, who, who, who were scared and angry and uh, threatened by what these movements represented. So in, in the 68 and 72 election campaigns, uh, this is when Nixon employs this Southern strategy, this attempt to appeal to working class voters, uh, especially in the South, who were former Democrats, um, but were angry about the social movements, the urban rebellion, the countercultural youth. Nixon got up there and, and proclaimed himself the law and order candidate um, with uh, thinly veiled racism coded as concern with crime and drugs. So the Southern strategy wasn't only, you know, implemented with regard to winning over Southern voters. It was, you know, uh, across the country to try to appeal to um, like working class white people who had, you know, for generations, they had been voting for the Democratic Party um, but they were, you know, as I said in the previous slide, angry and scared and threatened by the changes that was that were taking place uh, in the country at large. And so Nixon comes along and declares himself the law and order candidate, which is like one of the most um, <laughs> humorous ironies of, of American history, because Nixon would proceed to break all sorts of laws and uh, would have to resign in disgrace because of the, the, the laws that uh, he had broken as president. Um, but nonetheless, it's kind of like, I mean, and, and Trump did the same thing. Like, you know, when they talk about being law and order, they don't mean like law and order for them. <laughs> they, they mean like law and order for like, you know, poor people and black and brown people and, you know, you know, people in like urban communities. Um, they don't mean like law and order for the elites. They mean law and order for the rest of the population that at a time when, you know, the rest of the population is engaged in like rebellion and, you know, and, and uh, there's a, there's a sense of like order being threatened. <laughs> 
So employing this after uh, also employing this Southern strategy to win the formerly Democratic white working class voters, the Reagan administration escalated the war on drugs shortly after taking office in 1981. As part of its war on drugs, the Reagan administration increased federal assistance for local police departments, along with media campaigns like the Just Say No campaign. The Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1986 mandated a minimum sentence of five years without parole for, gram for possession of five grams of crack cocaine while it mandated the same for possession of 500 grams of powder cocaine. So the Nixon administration had really used the war on drugs as a rhetorical strategy to get more votes. Um, the Reagan administration not only did that, but then once they came to power, started to institutionalize all these kinds of things. So you know, like we talked about in the previous slide, this this apartheid sentencing, this this uh, extreme differential between sentencing for crack versus sentencing for for uh, powder cocaine. This was implemented by the Reagan administration. Uh, the Reagan administration, you know, also begins to pump money into local police departments and incentivizes them to kind of militarize in the way that we also talked about in a previous slide. And there's all this kind of, you know, also this, this kind of media campaign, um, including, you know, these these humorous, uh, not intentionally humorous, but in retrospect, very humorous ads where they'd like crack an egg in a frying pan and be like, oh, this is your brain on drugs. Like the egg is your brain. And then they crack it and put it in a frying pan and be like, oh, this is your brain on drugs. Um, so all of these were a sort of multi-pronged effort um, that really created a kind of um, a kind of like moral panic uh, uh, around uh, drug use and thereby you know, help to um, legitimate this mass incarceration. This is basically scared uh, a lot of people into being just like, you know, just get rid of these drug dealers and throw away the key. And, you know, it kind of frightened people into these extremely repressive measures. Um, again, not for the first time or the last, certainly not the last time. Um, the election of 1988 is a real key watershed moment for this because, um, well, for a number of reasons, it, it shows how effective the, the Republican strategy had been. And it also um, after the election of 1988, the Democrats, also begin to kind of hop on board with this uh, rhetoric around getting tough on crime and and getting you know cr tough on drugs and all this sort of thing. So in the election of 1988, the Republicans kept control of the presidency with George H. W. Bush uh, by portraying Democrats as soft on crime. This would end up being the winning issue for the Republicans in 1988. Um, was to present themselves as, you know, being tough and the Democrats as being soft. The Re Republicans ran an effective TV ad uh, accusing the Democrat uh, candidate of paroling a black criminal, Willie Horton, who committed more violent crimes during a temporary release. The ad has since been widely viewed as a textbook example of dog whistle politics that summon racialized fears by invoking crime. Following their defeat in 1988, the Democrats show, uh, try to show they can be tough on crime like the Republicans. So basically what's happening is like the, the, the Democrats have nominated uh, the former governor of Massachusetts, a guy by the name of Michael Dukakis, and he's polling ahead through much of 1988. And it looks like, you know, he may very well 
win the White House. And uh, so the Republicans um, run this advertisement uh, that talks about how when um, when he was governor, when uh, Dukakis was governor, he paroled this guy and they, they show his picture here, Willie Horton. And when he was out on parole uh, or furloughed, uh, Willie Horton went out and, you know, committed uh, these horrific crimes. And so this was like the way that the Republicans kind of took aim at the Democrats and said, like, you know, they're they're too uh, liberal, you know, bleeding hearts when it comes to, to crime. They're too easy and too soft on crime issues. And after that ad, it really, the polling switched um, and uh, the Republican, George H.W. Bush, would end up winning that election. And the Democrats really took um, a kind of lesson from this was that, you know, in order for them to compete, they took the lesson that they too were going to have to get tough on crime like the Republicans, that this was the only way that politically, you know, that they could really compete. And so this is kind of what happens with the Clinton administration. Bill Clinton, uh, you know, was nominated by the party in 1992. And he makes a point of basically trying to sound like he's just as tough on crime, if not more hard on crime than the Republicans are. And then when he gets into office, Bill Clinton um, actually escalates the mass incarceration and the war on drugs even further. And so that's why, like, throughout the 1990s, we see the amount of the prison population continuing to increase uh, and in increase in, in quite dramatic uh, numbers. So soon the Democratic Party had adopted this discourse about the need to get tough on crime and to show zero tolerance for drug offenders. Uh, Bill, President Clinton signed a $30 billion crime bill in 1994 as Democrats tried to compete with the Republicans for taking the lead on issues of crime, drugs, and welfare reform. They're trying to show that they're that, you know, that they, too, could get tough and that they weren't, you know, uh, liberal bleeding hearts, um, but that they were, you know, in fact, could be just as punitive as the Republicans were. And so in the 1990s, incarceration rates continue to increase as the war on drugs became permanent, supported by a bipartisan consensus. So now, once you have both parties, you know, on board with um, this policy, there is really the, the floodgates were open and there was no stopping um, the trend towards mass incarceration. So this is how we sort of historically get to the period that, you know, we're at now um, where you have this, you know, the United States being the leading incarcerator. Uh, in the world. I think it's something like one out of every five people who's behind bars is, is in America. Like we have, you know, 5% of the um, uh, world's population in the United States, but like 20% of the world's prison population. I highly recommend the film um, 13th as a documentary style way of kind of looking at this at this problem and um, it features inter interviews with Michelle Alexander and, and a number of other people who have been working towards criminal justice reform. So I highly recommend that you check that out. Uh, the next lecture will be um, continuing to look at institutions and the reproduction of inequality. Um, we'll be looking at the media um, and uh, then at, you know, the the uh, fields of culture and, and language, uh, you know, as, as practices in society and how those also contribute to uh, social inequality. Uh, for now, I'm gonna stop the share and uh, wish you a good day.
Bye.